Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Bruno Yoon, and I'm one of the Athenaeum Fellows this year. Anyone who's ever lied on the grass and looked at the clouds knows this feeling I'm about to describe. You eventually come across a cloud that looks like a dog or, or a slice of the pizza that you had too much of last night. If there are no clouds and it's very dark at night, you, you see stars and patterns that look like scorpions and bears and serpent bears. You're, Greeks had a vivid imagination for that one. Um, these are all examples of pareidolia, where we look at randomness and see patterns that aren't there. We see the chaos of nature and try to impose a structure on it to make it seem like something we're familiar with. We've always done that, whether through pareidolia or physically through urban development or particularly unscrupulous resource extraction. So think in particular about hiking trails. Those are artificial creations. We've taken a continuous strip of land and designated it as a strip of land we'd like to walk on regularly because we like the view or whatever. So we're walking along paths determined and in many cases built by other humans. Not totally untamed nature like we like to think of it, unless of course you're the first, a literal trailblazer, which our speaker tonight is. And her name's Liz Thomas, class of 2007. She's here to share what she's learned while hiking these paths and discuss more broadly the future of trails and conservation. She spent quite a bit of time outdoors, definitely more than me. She's hiked, she's hiked all 2,181 miles of the Appalachian Trail. By the way, she holds the women's unsupported speed record for that trail. Her hiking odometer, I guess, is over 17,000 miles. And she wrote the award-winning book, Long Trails, Mastering the Art of the Through Hike, which, by the way, is for sale in the lobby as you walk out. She majored in EEP, Environment, Economics, and Politics, and then she went off to Yale for a master's in environmental science. She was also the student manager right here at the Athenaeum. And she's also on the board for the Roberts Environmental Center. And she's editor-in-chief of Treeline Review, an outdoor web magazine. Now, by the way, now the time's, to adjust your, now's the time to adjust your seat if you've already done so. And, and, a, and, a, and, a, and another warning, all the deities of nature from every culture and religion that ever believed in them are watching us tonight. They can do a lot to your cell phone that you don't want to happen, so put it away. <laughs> Unless you want a goddess in the form of a bird to sweep in, snatch it out of your hands and fly away. By the way, they'll take your cameras and audio recorders too, so don't record this talk, whether through audio or visually. You do not want the gods to see what you've been doing on your cell phone or what you've been recording. <laughs> And, and uh, one last thing, uh, Q&A is going to work a little bit differently tonight. Um, I'll, I'm going to have you all write your, any questions you have about the talk on your car, on the index cards on, on, at each of your tables. And, 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 uh, one of, and I or one of the Af, Athenam staff will come around to collect them at the end and I'll hand them off to Liz and she'll read them off. So. So no, so, so no microphones tonight. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming our very own Liz Thomas. Thank you so much, Bruno. Um, I'm gonna make sure my cell phone is turned off right now. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Bruno, for that introduction. Um, I think every CMC student dreams of the day when they can stand up here. And let me tell you, it is just as exhilarating and terrifying as you think it is. Um, I want to thank the Athenaeum, Priya, and David Edwards for inviting me here to speak, and also Chef Dave for making this meal that was at my request, which was a very important meal back when I was a student here um, at the student manager. I spent a lot of time behind those doors as the student manager, and I can't say I've ever been to a talk at the ATH where the speaker has requested everyone applaud for everyone on the other side of the doors, the students who work here and the staff. So I'm going to be that speaker. Can we have a round of applause for everyone over there? <laughs> All right, now down to some very serious Athenaeum business. Walking thousands of miles, or as it's generally referred to, through hiking. So before we start, who here in this room has heard of through hiking? All right, you did sign up for this talk, so there was a little bit of a blurb in there. Who here dreams of one day going on a long hiking trip, 100 miles, 1,000 miles? Wow, that's really awesome. And has anyone here gone on a through hike or a long hike? Whoa, wow, there, there's a few hands in here. Um, 
Normally, I would ask people what trails, but this room is so big, I'm, I'm going to let you tell your neighbors instead. Um, but you're going to keep me honest during this talk, which is the important part. So my goal at the end of this talk is to have at least one of student here in this room consider today, instead of going immediately to a consulting firm or investment bank or working as a staffer or whatever it is that CMC students do right after graduation these days, Instead, make a decision that is very out of the box for a CMC graduate. And that, my dream, is that at the end of this talk, one of you, just one, that's all I'm asking here, will be inspired to go and take a long walk instead. You can go to your consulting firm after that. <laughs> and my goal here, too, is perhaps to have the community members or the professors or the staff in this room who are wondering, maybe what to do after retirement, or how to take a major break or career change, uh, to consider taking a long walk as a time to reflect on that transition as well. But first, I want to introduce you to the three major long distance hiking trails that I'll be talking about here today. These are the three um, trails that most people will have heard of, the Appalachian Trail over here, um, the Pacific Crest Trail here, and the Continental Divide Trail down the Rockies here. And this talk, as some of you may know, is not just, hey, look at Liz hike these 2,000 miles, how does she do it? But this is also a talk that celebrates what these three trails are part of. They're part of the National Trail System, which was made possible through the National Trails Act, which celebrated its 50th anniversary just last week. And being a CMC alum, for me, that means policy. And because the magnitude and the scale of these giant, giant trails, a scale of, okay, one foot wide, but thousands and thousands of miles long, uh, for the most part, all on public land, this is nothing short of a policy miracle. So some of you might have known that through hiking has blown up in recent years. This is one of the reasons uh, the movie Wild, starring Reese Witherspoon, which was based on the number one New York Times bestseller, Wild, um, both about um, Cheryl Strayed's trip on the Pacific Crest Trail. A little bit before that was a Bill Bryson book that was also a New York Times bestseller, A Walk in the Woods, um, which was turned into a movie with Robert Redford, Nick Nolte, and Emma Thompson, which somehow managed to not be that great. Uh, also called A Walk in the Woods about the Appalachian Trail. But because this is CMC, you might have heard of the Appalachian Trail from a different reason. This guy. <laughs> <laughs> I tried so hard to keep that a secret from, from him. Uh, <laughs> this is Governor Mark Sanford who in of South Carolina, who in 2009, June of 2009, told his staffers he was going to hike the Appalachian Trail. To went totally off the radar for a week. His wife and his Secret Service couldn't find him, and it turns out he was in Argentina with his mistress using public funds to get there. <laughs> <laughs> so, no matter what your introduction is to long distance hiking, <laughs> mine was here, here at CMC. So, this, by the way, is the only photo I could find of myself in college at CMC that wasn't taken outdoors. So this is in a dorm room that clearly has a lot of trash. <laughs> and I had clearly just gone to snack and gotten myself a coffee or a giant thing of soft serve. Um, but my outdoor career actually started here at CMC. I didn't grow up in a particularly outdoorsy family, and I didn't grow up in a particularly uh, easy to access the outdoors area either. But I did have a first grade teacher who took us hiking, and I use that in quotes, in a natural area that was supposed to be turned into a golf course, but then it was set aside, and it had maybe one mile of trail filled with invasive species. And as a kid, I thought this was the coolest thing ever. And I would ask my parents to take me there weekend after weekend. In fact, I loved it so much that I had my third grade birthday party there. <laughs> oh, it gets better. So I invited everyone in my third grade class to come join, and clearly, when, if we're going to go hiking, we might as well go at the best time when all the wildlife is out. So I asked everyone a modest request 
show up at the trailhead at 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> and surprisingly, some people actually did. Uh, at the time, I did go on one family camping trip to Yosemite's high country. Um, and my parents made me hike, and it turned out that hiking in Yosemite, even on a kid-sized hike, was a lot harder than that flat one-mile trip in the invasive species filled nature reserve. I was kind of an out-of-shape kid. I refused to do sports. Uh, I was the slowest running the mile in my fifth grade class. But I loved being in Yosemite, and even now, my sister and I would talk, ab my sister and I would talk about it for years to come, and even now we talk about that as a transformative moment. And we didn't realize it at the time, but as I look back on that trip, it was incredibly formative to the person who I became and the choices I made as an adult. So my first year, back at CMC, <laughs> there were a few very sad events that also influenced how I was going to go about my life. And they didn't happen to me directly, but they happened to people who I was very close to. Um, and they ended up shaping how I thought about life and what I wanted to do with it. So when I was a first here, when I was 18 here, all within the spring semester of my first year, my roommate, my boyfriend, and probably my closest friend at CMC at the time, all lost a parent very quickly and unexpectedly. And this made me realize that life is short. And there were so many things I wanted to do and places I wanted to go. And up until that point, I had been ready to accept that the excuse that I couldn't go do these things that I wanted to do in these places I wanted to see is because there was a desk and work with, their, with my name on it. But I also realized that I couldn't sit back and just wait for these places to come to me, um, for these things to happen. I couldn't hope that other people were going to take me to those places or take me on those experiences. It was up to me to do the things that I wanted to do before it was too late. So around this time, I became involved with, I apologize, this photo is so dark, but it's vintage. Um, <laughs> around this time, I started getting involved with On the Loose, which at the time, I think there's still the five colleges outdoor club. Um, I know that CMC has a club now, but that didn't exist when I was here. And this is a photo of me taken during uh, fall break on Mount Whitney, on the Mountaineers route. I also took a first responder course up at Harvey Mudd as my mandatory PE course and a wilderness first aid training with uh, On the Loose. And around this time, I also started feeling disillusioned with my declared econ gov major. And <laughs> my classes felt very abstract, like there wasn't this greater purpose tying the two disciplines together um, with something that I really cared about, something that really gave me a reason for studying what I was studying. And that's when I learned about the EEP major, the Environment Economics Politics major, led at that time by Professor Emil Moorhart, who's here in this photo, um, who's since retired. And I also learned of the relationship between EEP majors and the Roberts Environmental Center, of which I've been on the board for the last three years. Um, and the Roberts Environmental Center owns a research station in the Sierra, not too far from that place in Yosemite I had visited as a child. So a big thanks to Peter Hong and the CMC public affairs team for helping me track down these photos, which were taken for the CMC alumni magazine. Um, and apparently this one was actually turned into a banner that they hang up around campus um, to show that students at CMC do science. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that summer we were <laughs> researching uh, a forest service project to reseed native plants after a wildfire. This was also the first time I had hung out with CMCers who had the same interest in the outdoors as me. Up until then, I definitely thought of that quintessential CMC student as the guy in a suit on a skateboard. And I had made some friends at CMC, but this was the first time I interacted with people who really appreciated adventure. And Ina and Chris here had just come back from environmental programs studying abroad in Tanzania and really encouraged me to do the same. So I studied abroad in Botswana on an environmental program we, where we had two, three two-week homestays and the rest of the semester was spent camping and I absolutely adored it. And when I came back, I was rejuvenated, not just for a feeling of adventure, but also for that experiential learning style I had while studying abroad. I found that I cared about the places I had been and the policy issues that were relevant to those places so much more having lived through them and seen their consequences and seen the people who were impacted by them. And although I had been climbing for a couple of years, I took the CMC uh, rock climbing PE class, 
I was mentored in climbing here by, among others, Jim Pinterlucky, who is in the audience, um, who's retired from the math department, um, and he took this photo here, which I'm there, and he's, he, he's standing probably where he, he's sitting right now, taking that photo, um, as well as Professor David Harris over at Harvey Mudd. And until then, hiking had always kind of been as a, a way for me to train for climbing. And my senior year, I had two sheets of paper hanging up in my dorm room that I'd written in Sharpie. One were my climbing goals, and the other were my hiking goals. And climbing, I had to do with others. Um, someone had to belay. So hiking would be the thing I would do when I couldn't find other people who would want to come along with me. So one of the things that I did pretty regularly is I climbed Baldy on Wednesdays at 5 a.m. before classes, because why not? <laughs> And as I did more and more hikes, they became increasingly ambitious. And at that point, hiking was this thing, as I said, to get in shape for climbing. But after I sprained a tendon at the climbing gym um, towards the end of my first semester senior year, I wasn't able to climb. Um, I had to let it heal. My mind went towards that other list of goals that I had lined up there, which was hiking. The Thanksgiving of my senior year, I stayed on campus and did a self-supported hike of Baldi, San Gregorio, and San Jacinto all in a day solo. <laughs> Which even now, I, I think I could do the actual hiking, but I wouldn't want to do the driving in between. Um, <laughs> that semester, I also took some 5C athletes on a pretty aggressive hiking trip from Iron Mountain to, or from Baldi to Iron Mountain, for those of you who are familiar with that hike. Um, and, you know, I'd been an out-of-shape kid. I thought that these actual athletes would be way fitter and way faster than me in hiking. And um, it, it didn't quite end up that way, uh, in fact. And we ended up doing what is referred to as epicking out there, um, which meant we camped out on the mountain without any gear. It was not great. I was pretty ashamed being the leader of that trip. <laughs> but it was around that time that I realized, well, I was a pretty okay climber. Um, and I really identified more as a climber. Um, it was part of my identity. Hiking was something not only that I enjoyed, but I seemed particularly skilled at. So at some point during my hikes in Southern California, I discovered the Pacific Crest Trail, which is a long distance path that goes from Mexico to Canada through the Sierra and the Cascades. And a lot of peaks around here, if you climb them, not Baldy, but Baden Powell, for example, cross the PCT or use the PCT as an access path. And while these signs that said 2,000 miles of Canada, 1,000 miles of Mexico, those numbers aren't quite right, um, piqued my interest, it was on my days off at the uh, REC research station up near Yosemite that piqued my interest in distance hiking. So I spent three summers up there, and aside from my first year, year students would come up for a month, do that plant study, and then move on to their next summer internship. But because I was working there on my own research, not the plant study, I had to collect data all summer. And I actually designed my studies so that I would be there all summer and that my studies would require me to go hiking. And it was on probably the first year, so there were still other people up there all summer, uh, that I met these scraggly guys, that's actually me and a friend of mine, but you get the idea, scraggly looking people, uh, who I, was, I had just gone on a, for me at that time, 10 mile hike, I was very proud of myself. I went over to the little cafe there to get some food, and all the tables were taken with tourists, except for this one that had a little bit of space with these like really smelly, scraggly guys in dirty clothes, totally covered in dirt, sunburnt, and I wanted the seat, so I sat next to them and started talking, and it turned out they were hiking the Pacific Crest Trail. And that was a really big snow year, and they had gone through a horrendous year in the Sierra, um, just post holing through snow and getting really sunburnt and going through snow melt raging rivers. And they told me of the 100 people who had started that year, three people had unfortunately uh, been taken by the trail. And the more they told me about how they wanted to quit and how hard it was, the more I wanted to do it. So I came back to CMC um, after, after the end of my sophomore year and I remember sitting in my dorm room for hours, not doing my homework, researching the PCT, which I really hope some of you end up doing. Um, and I decided the year after I graduated CMC, I'd hike the PCT too. So at the urging of Bill Asher, who is here, <laughs> um, who many of you know, I decided to go to graduate school after CMC with a year gap between CMC and the Yale School of Forestry. 
And during that time, um, you know, I had been planning on hiking the PCT, but there was no way I could enroll in Yale, which started the beginning of August, and also hike the PCT. So I wasn't going to be able to hike the trail that fast the way the seasons worked out. So instead, I took a crazy jump and decided to go over to the Appalachian Trail. So the Appalachian Trail is a 2,100, almost 200 mile trail that starts down in Georgia and goes all the way up to Maine. And hiking the AT was one of the first things I did in my life where I wasn't doing it because a teacher told me or a parent told me or because an adult said, this is what you're supposed to do next in life. Quite the contrary. In fact, even some of my, my climbing and hiking mentors here were kind of hiking the East Coast, the biggest mountain there, 6,000 feet tall. Uh, it was the first real big decision I made totally uh, out of the blue. And it went against what so many people had expected for someone like me. So I um, did a bunch of research, and this was my first day hiking the Appalachian Trail. I did a bunch of research. I knew that I wanted a really light pack. Um, and unfortunately, one of the ways that I decided to cut weight was by not carrying a sleeping bag, also a tent. And at that point, I wasn't really quite sure how to use my stove and might have melted it that first night. I had hiked quite a bit around here and some very aggressive hikes around here, but they had all been around 24 hours. And aside from a backpacking trip that I'd led in the Grand Canyon with On the Loose, which I don't know what they were thinking letting me lead a backpacking trip having not gone backpacking before, but they did. It was awesome. Everyone was fine. Um, it became clear that backpacking was a very different animal than s even some of the aggressive day hikes that I had done. I was also on the East Coast for more or less the first time, and I never hiked in the rain before, <laughs> and I never hiked in a humid climate, and my thoughts that the South was going to be warm and warm uh, were not true. <laughs> so luckily, the Appalachian Trail, 30 miles in, literally, the trail goes through a gear store, and I got myself a sleeping bag. Um, when I say I didn't have a tent, I'm kind of lying. I had a hammock that had a tarp over it, so it was a shelter. Um, I got myself a bunch of gear, and um, this spot 30 miles in, by the way, the first paved road crossing, so one-third of the people who start the Appalachian Trail quit here 30 miles in. They go on home to Atlanta. And in fact, w with a trail like the Appalachian Trail that has the um, strongest data, about 25 to 30 percent of people end up making it. Everyone else qu quits somewhere along the way. So the finish rates... Um, Finish rates on these trails are very hard because they're, they're difficult. Um, and one of the things I talk, actually, one, I, I talk about it quite often in my book, how to go about um, making sure that if you want to set out being one of the people who finish, that you actually can. So, um, and as you'll hear in this story, there's a lot of mistakes that taught me that along the way, <laughs> including not carrying a sleeping bag. So, uh, a few days further, I was in Smoky Mountain National Park, and I'd just done this big climb, I set up my hammock, and this huge rainstorm came in. I'm like, all right, I'm in my hammock, under this tarp, it's fine. And I wake up in the middle of the night, and I'm feeling cold, and then I'm feeling wet, and I pull out my headlamp, and there's streams of water coming down my tarp, right into my hammock, which is essentially turned into a hanging bathtub. <laughs> and my sleeping bag is getting increasingly wet and soaked, and I'm cold, and I don't know what to do, and I know if I get out of my sleeping bag and fix my tarp, then I'll get wetter and colder, and ah, it was so overwhelming. So I thought, okay, you know what? I'm not going to move, because that seems really cold. But if I have one more night like this, I'm out. I'm going back to California. <laughs> and luckily, for all of you who are here today listening to me speak, that didn't happen. In fact, the next day was beautiful. It was magical. Uh, and as I walked through this area where the grass was green and the trees were flowering out, I felt like the ground was imbued with this magic, with the history of the area I was walking through that I had this connection to the people who had walked here before and the animals. And this sort of connection suddenly made me realize I, I forgot all my problems from the night before. And this, I think, is something that's so common when long distance hiking. There's these high highs and low lows. And the more that I've hiked, the more I've realized that they all kind of balance out and they balance out ahead. So one of the things I learned is as I hiked, I had this new confidence I didn't have as a student. And as I'm sure many of you know, young people around the world, at least um, who comes from 
from privileged backgrounds will often after college go abroad and take a gap year to gain that confidence, to gain an understanding of a country or of a culture or a people different than their own. And I'm incredibly thankful and grateful that here in the US we have this unique system of wild areas through the National Scenic Trail system where young people can have that experience on the cheap in the US in a country that speaks English uh, can stay here, support local economies, and still grow as individuals. In fact, the National Scenic Trail System here in the US is so good that it attracts people from around the world. Ken Burns, um, for those of you who have seen his National Parks uh, documentary, he often talks about how the National Parks are this crown jewel of the US, the, the best idea um, that we've ever come up with, and applaud the policies that led to that. But no, there are actually National Parks in other countries. Uh, there are beautiful protected places in other countries too. But a trail system that is a complete and free to exploration and camping that touches the scenic, natural, and historic highlights of the US's landscape and is as long and as expansive as our system can't be found anywhere else in the world. And time and time again, I meet people from other countries who say, oh no, we don't want to hike where we are. The US is so much better. Um, it truly is a crown jewel of America. So I also learned that not only is the South cold, but it can snow. Back, back, to, to, back to my experience on the trail. And because I had felt so confident of my hiking skills, I decided that I was going to send home all my cold weather gear, including my puffy jacket. So I was left with nothing but shorts, a tank top, and a four ounce thin wind shirt waking up to snow and it was so cold I didn't want to stop to eat my Snickers bar. It was so cold I didn't want to get more water to drink and my legs became chapped from the coldness and the trail had turned icy. Um, and that was really difficult. <laughs> and I have a lot more to say about that, but it was a lesson that was really difficult um, to learn and something that I've not forgotten. The Appalachian Trail, I like to say, the Appalachian Mountain Range used to be bigger than the Himalaya, or about comparable. Um, it's one of the oldest mountain ranges in the, in the world. Um, but over time, the uh, glaciers have knocked down those, those heights. And I as I like to joke, it's not actually geologically true, they dumped all those rocks in the state of Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, but the Appalachian Trail, because it was one of the earliest trails that was constructed, goes straight up and down every single mountain. So these are actually in meters. I don't know why the elevation is in meters. Um, which is unlike the other long distance trails that kind of take a contoured, uh, lower grade approach, more like a road that a car might go on. Instead, you go straight up and down, um, making the Appalachian Trail, even though it's the shortest of the trails and it doesn't go to 14 or 13,000 feet like the other trails, have more elevation gain. So it's very physically demanding. So spoiler alert, I finished the Appalachian Trail. <laughs> but New Hampshire and Maine were especially difficult for me and my knees hurt, and my neck hurt, and my joints hurt, and I was tired all the time. I thought, oh, that just comes from long distance hiking. But when I still had that issue a month out, I thought, hmm, I'm having trouble getting up these stairs to my apartment. Maybe I should get this checked out. Sure enough, I had Lyme disease. And for most people, having struggled as hard I did, as I did in New Hampshire and Maine, realizing that the trail gave them a serious disease like Lyme, should have been a sign to stop. But for me, it was another one of those minor obstacles, like that elevation gain on the Appalachian Trail, another hill to climb between me and more hiking trails. When I first started hiking, I had a lot of reservations. I thought of it as a macho thing, that it required intimidating, expensive equipment. And it was not really something that someone like me could get into seriously. But after I actually started doing it, both here and on the Appalachian Trail, I realized that there were things I could do with my own two feet that could be even more empowering and rewarding than anything I had ever done in my life. I was exhilarated by my own human power. And the more I hiked, the more I could realize I could take on obstacles that looked and sounded impossible, from climbing a mountain to going across the country to climb mountains to hiking from Georgia to Maine. Well, then it was time to go to graduate school. <laughs> and I had been planning to look at elephants in Botswana or research stakeholders and management of a national park somewhere. 
But after hiking the Appalachian Trail, I couldn't stop thinking about what a marvel it was that I had walked a trail that went through 14 different states and crossed so many different jurisdictions uh, that had so many stakeholders involved and that existed for the most part on public land. And at the time, there was barely any literature on trails aside from what CMCers would probably call fairly superficial data. Uh, number of users, quotas, technical trail building stuff. And while that stuff is important, um, in graduate school, I really wanted to understand the why and also the how um, of problems that existed along these trails, problems that existed in the making of these trails um, and in the future of these trails in a new, more nuanced, policy-driven kind of way. Around the time, I became obsessed with this guy, Benton Mackay. Um, he was born in 1879 and trained as a forester and an urban planner. He's actually thought of as the first regional planner. And this was actually taken um, at the National Conservation Leadership Center in West Virginia, where um, if any of you ever become involved in conservation, every conservation group goes there, and it's like the most special thing to be in this place where the dining hall um, has all of these conservationists' photos on the wall like rock stars. Um, of course, I had to go find Benton and take my photo with him. So Benton Mackay, he was also the first to write against urban sprawl in an academic journal and he was a founding member of the Wilderness Society. So it's in part because of this man that I'm up here even speaking at all. Because in 1919, he climbed a mountain, Stratton Mountain, which some of you might have skied on in Vermont, um, and dreamed up this idea of hiking, of a trail that went along the spine of the Appalachian Mountains, um, all the way from Georgia to Maine. And he did this at a time before the national highway system, which is pretty crazy. And we take for granted today that long roads existed, but he really wanted to put together a trail system. Um, so back to me in graduate school, there wasn't much on Benton Mackay in the literature, but he's gotten trendier, I will say, in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, as urban planners are rediscovering him and the conservation community in general is starting to become more focused on the people who live near the trail um, instead of taking such a top-down, expert-driven kind of approach. Um, Benton wrote in academic journals about the trail as this community builder um, and conservation as a way to serve a diversity of people out there, not just wealthy people who could afford to go hike. And the trail was also a place where he had this idea where you could hike from work camp to work camp. Um, mostly how that survives on the Appalachian Trail today is that there's these three-sided shelters, which are really great. You can be out of the rain without putting up your tent but there is a little bit of a culture of work for stay in the towns along the Appalachian Trail. Um, but he imagined the Appalachian Trail as a place where people could actually gain some work skills. So those ideas were pretty out there for 100 years ago, but right now they are cutting edge. <laughs> and it's what a lot of the people in the conservation community are talking about, not the work camp thing so much. Um, in two weeks, I'm speaking at the Trust for Public Land National Leadership Conference in Atlanta about some of the things Benton Mackay had, had uh, talked about, and I'll also explain about my research uh, on trails, and you'll see why as I get further. So from Benton Mackay's first idea of the Appalachian Trail, uh, with the work of people on the ground, such as his sworn enemy, Myron Avery, the Appalachian Trail was finished. In October 2nd, 1968, it became the first national scenic trail, um, which is defined as a trail over 100 miles long, with nationally significant uh, scenic, historic, natural, or cultural qualities. Um, and they have a protected conservation status, which is not too different from national parks, actually. So although I had poo-pooed the idea of studying national park ma management, it turns out that by looking at these national scenic trails, I was actually looking at how st stakeholders were involved in the management of a very, very long, skinny park. Similarly, they have to be designated and authorized by an act of Congress. So there's 11 of these now that have been formed over 50 years. As you can imagine, it's very difficult. So a week ago marked the 50th anniversary of LBJ signing the National Trails Act. And his justification here is, you can read it, to promote essentially having fun, recreation. Notice how the language there doesn't say anything about the economic advantages of mostly rural areas where these trails go by, or about the wildlife that live in the corridors that these trails allow for. 
Um, there's been scientific studies that show that migrating birds will go from Canada down to South America following the Appalachian Trail, which is crazy. But those are the areas that have been conserved on the East Coast. But the lesson here is that policies are complicated. And something as grand and as big and as long that goes through so many jurisdictions as a National Scenic Trail is going to require thinking about them from a lot of different angles. Because it's not the 1960s anymore, and when I go to advocate for trails in DC, the enjoyment of people just isn't gonna cut it anymore. <laughs> and that's really where a liberal arts education, I think, comes in very useful because we're taught here at CMC to think about problems, not just in terms of those technical issues, that, like the number of users, that superficial data. We realize that isn't enough to solve the problem. But thinking more holistically about the different kinds of values that people who are affected by the trail are going to have, that's the sort of thing that's actually gonna help you achieve your goals and prevent problems in the future. So at this point, there are more miles in the national trail system than there are get this, in the interstate highway system. 50,000 miles versus 46,000. And over 30 national, scenic, and historic trails and 1,000 national recreation trails. So this is what I mean when I say that our national trail system is the envy of any other system in the world. So 1968 was a big year for conservation. A lot of the national parks we kind of take for granted now, North Cascades, Redwoods were formed during that year, right around the same time. And like the National Trails Act, I like to look at each anniversary here as a reminder that leaders made this happen, and visionaries who are willing to take a risk. And I think reflecting back on my time at CMC, I had this notion of what leadership meant, and it meant wearing a suit and sitting at a long table and hanging out with a bunch of boring people. <laughs> and the more time I've had to reflect, the more I realize there's something else that binds together what it means to be a CMC student. And leadership can be at a board room full of boring people, but it can also be leading a movement for a new wilderness area or for a new conservation idea. So taking that information that I'd learned about Benton Mackay and more tra traditional large scale regional or interstate protected areas like Yellowstone, which was and is still being studied by my mentor at Yale, Susan Clark, I took to the Pacific Crest Trail which you may remember I had also really wanted to hike when I was at CMC. <laughs> so I went to go hike that trail as part of my research. And one of the things that I realized is although I'd spent a lot of time hiking around here, adjusting to walking through the desert between 20 and 30 miles without water was a big shock. Then walking at 12,000 to 13,500, uh, 13, 5,000, feet covered in snow crossing raging snowmelt rivers is also another challenge. But whether your experience on the trail, sorry about that, whether your experience on the trail is good or disastrous, it's memorable. And when people go on backpacking trips or hiking trips, memories seem to sit in your head a lot deeper and more intensely than in our daily lives. I see a few people nodding there. Um, and to me, this is what LBJ was talking about when he says a legacy for our grandchildren, which is us here in this room now, to create a space where these memories can be formed and where my experience and your experience out there in the mountains can be similar to that of someone hiking decades ago and hopefully similar to the experience of someone who will hike decades in the future. And there's not many places where we can say that that is true. So back to my research, one of the things I discovered is an interesting relationship between hikers, trail towns, um, where hikers go in to get food and to take a shower and to sleep in a real bed, and those who have some authority or, for, or control over the management of the public lands around the trail or the trail itself. All National Scenic Trails, by the way, are publicly administered by the Park Service or the Forest Service, but they're all run part of this public-private nonprofit or public-private partnership with nonprofit trail organizations. And as you can imagine, agencies are cash strapped. The Forest Service is spending a ton of money on wildfires lately, and that gives these nonprofits a lot of power. Who has authority and control over the trail? And certainly the perceived notion of that among users and among people who live near the trail was a really interesting policy question for me. Um, so when you do study public and private partnerships, possibly in class, this is a really interesting example. One of the things that surprised me the most about the PCT is the friendship. In my 17,000 miles of hiking long trails, 
I've met thousands of hikers of all ages, backgrounds, and abilities. And while we always love to talk about how our society is increasingly divided and polarized, on the trail, I've been able to connect with people from all sorts of states, ways of thinking, backgrounds, some that are very, very different than my own. And something about taking away our status symbols, our clothes, our cars, our house, even our jobs, and removing us from those parts of our identity that divide us is a great leveler. On trail, we all have this shared goal of, oh, got to make it from Mexico to Canada. Or we all just have this shared experience of, oh, how was that storm last night for you? Did you get wet? These are the things that form lifelong friendships. And while the trails still aren't as diverse as I'd like them to be, it's the best I've seen so far to create that time and that space to meet with others that are very different than ourselves. Also, the trails provide a space and a place to reflect, discover answers to things on our minds, problems at school or at work, stuff that isn't Googleable, or more personal things like how to take the next step in a career, how to change careers, what to do in a relationship, or what to do after college. Hikes can help us transition through life, or as Cheryl Strays talks about in Wild, get over trauma, heal ourselves. So through trails, so many people's lives are changed through nature and the power of their own bodies by separating themselves from the constant reminders of who they were so they can remember who they are. So no matter the distance of trails, hikers end up coming back a little more empowered, inspired to do good in the world. So after graduating from I finished the PCT <laughs> and then immediately rushed off to graduate school. After finish graduating um, from Yale, I went to go hike the Continental Divide Trail, uh, <laughs> which goes along the Rockies from Canada to Mexico. It's the last bit of the Triple Crown Trails. Um, and before you ever even start the Continental Divide Trail, you are required to watch a 20-minute video on how grizzly bears are going to kill and eat you. And that is how the Continental Divide Trail is for the first thousand miles or so. You're walking through grizzly habitat. And because of the short weather window, especially for people who are hiking southbound on the Continental Divide Trail, you start out in the snow in Montana, hopefully not too much. And your goal is to make it through southern Colorado before the snow starts up again at 12 and 13,000 feet at the end of September, early October. So you really have to hustle. And because I had been invited to be on President Obama's Outdoor Nation and Youth Council, I had to start the CDT a lot la later than the usual weather window. So I really had, the, the, had to make some moves. So there, there's snow and glacier. And the thing about the CDT is it's incredibly remote. I didn't see anyone beside my hiking partner from northern Colorado until I reached the Mexican border. No other hikers. I would go into town and I would see people and, you know, like buy food from them and that sort of thing. But there was no one else out there. It's incredibly remote. There's not always trail. The navigation is difficult. There's grizzly bears and you're rushing against the snow. And there's lots of mosquitoes and there's heat and there's cold. And there's all these things and every day was so hard. So one of the things that I talk about in my book is what do you do when every single day is hard? And one of the analogies that I use is when you're hiking, it's like you're a pilot that's scanning a whole bunch of different gauges. And you're scanning the gauge for mosquitoes, you're scanning for temperature and blisters and hunger and thirst. And the goal is to make sure that none of those go into the danger zone. Because with climbing, if you mess up once, you're dead. But with hiking, if you mess up three times, that, that's, that's not good either. And while it's impossible to keep all of those gauges, sometimes it's impossible to keep them all in the happy zone. You know, like the mosquitoes just aren't going to go away. Uh, you can do your best and be most likely to continue on if you keep your gauge in the good spot. So at the end of the CDT, by the way, if you were wondering, I didn't make it through the San Juans before the snow. I did make it through the San Juans, but the snow dumped, and it was one of the scariest uh, situations in my life. That's for another talk, though. So when I got to New Mexico, though, I knew that the end of my hiking career was about to happen and that this was going to be my last through hike. So I went slowly and cherished it um, because it was time to put on a suit and sit in that boardroom <laughs> and give up my adventures. And when I finished the CDT, I realized that, uh, you know what, maybe that's not actually what I want to do. I wanted to take the lessons I had learned on the Appalachian Trail 
I'd learned on the CD and CDT and take it to the Appalachian Trail. The th lessons I had learned on that remote, difficult, tear-inducing, trailless CDT and see if I could break the speed record on the Appalachian Trail. So I set three goals. One was to never have regrets because on the Continental Divide Trail, I had pushed so hard that I regretted a lot of the decisions I'd made and a lot of the places I'd passed up. Not to do something I felt was dangerous. Number two, if I could help it. And number three was not to cry because I'd spent a lot of time crying on the Continental Divide Trail and I was done with that. Crying, as far as I'm concerned, by the way, is one of those things, at least for me, where if I get to crying mode, the hike is over. So the AT ended up, the speed record, many people were like, oh, wasn't that hard? And yes, it was hard, but because I felt like I had learned from so many of my mistakes and was getting this chance to go back and correct them, it was a very joyful experience to me. I had learned from my mistakes of the past. Um, and two miles in, I saw something I'd never seen on the Continental Divide shell Trail, shelter, water, and a sign, also trail. <laughs> and so even though I didn't have a support team who was massaging my feet and handing me food and putting up my tent and all these things that you hear about, some of the really famous Appalachian Trail records these days, they have those support teams doing it ultra marathoner style, I felt like I had all the support of the volunteers and maintainers and those who built the trail and those who put in signs and shelters. Um, like they were coming along with me. That was that spot that was covered in snow and I had that miserable day when I hiked the Appalachian Trail before. This was the exact same day, April 29th, but three years later and I had learned so much and I actually had my cold weather gear with me still. And it was such a triumphant feeling to go there and know what I had learned. And these are the ponies of the Rhone Highlands in Virginia. And one of the things that I noticed is when I hiked the Appalachian Trail for the speed record the second time, I knew what was coming. I looked at my map and every day felt like I was greeting a friend. I was so excited about what was around the corner next. And so one of the things that I've thought about this is when you're not looking forward to what's going to happen the next day, it may be a sign that you're not doing something because you want to do it. And the converse is true too. If you're looking forward to every day, it's a good sign that you're doing something right. Again, I walked through New Hampshire. I had Lyme disease when it was a horrible pain last time. Now it was the happiest, most beautiful time of the trip. And I made it to Mount Katahdin. But first, I had quite a story. So I got up super early. I'd done about 30 miles to get to the base of Mount Katahdin, which is the finishing point of the Appalachian Trail. It's five miles to the top, about 5,000 feet of gain. And at the bottom, there's a sign that says, don't start going up this mountain until uh, after 8 a.m. So it's like noon. And there's also a weather gauge that says if it's a stage three, four, or five weather situation, don't go up there. So it was like a three or four. And I was like, it doesn't matter. I'm breaking a speed record. This is going to be awesome. I'm just going to go up there. So I go up there. I put in my headphones. I'm feeling awesome. And I hear some rumbling. And I think, ah, you know, it's just the bass in my headphones, whatever. And I see a bunch of people coming down the mountain looking really scared. I'm like, ah, they just want to get off the mountain, whatever. And then I get above tree line. And I see very clearly that indeed there's a lightning storm kind of going on. And I really should stay below tree line and probably get off the mountain. And so I made one of the most difficult decisions I had made that entire trip. And two miles from the top, turned around and went back to the base of that mountain. Because I realized there were so many things I wanted to do in life other than get the speed record for the Appalachian Trail. And so I went down to the base feeling pretty dejected, pretty close to breaking goal number three, which was not to cry. And I go into the ranger station and say, all right, I'm going to need a permit to camp here tonight because I'm going to go up the mountain. And I tried to do this, talking with the ranger who is totally unsympathetic. Pop my head outside. It's a bluebird day, not a cloud in the sky. And I pop my head back in, and I'm like, hey, you're, you're not going to believe this, but can, can I go up there? And the ranger kind of looks at me, smiles and winks. I take that as a yes, and I run up to the top. So that is this photo. Um, I'm the last person, only person up at the top. So from the Appalachian Trail, I've gone on to hike. Um, I've hiked more than 20 long distance trails in all sorts of ecosystems and countries around the world. And I've also gone on to teach a six week online course with Backpacker Magazine called Through Hiking 101 with Liz Thomas, that's me, um, and guest edit the long trails um, issue of 
Backpacker Magazine. But I also uh, wrote this book, Long Trails, uh, Mastering the Art of the Thru-Hike, which won the National Outdoor Book Award for Best Instructional Book. And it's the first book on thru-hiking to do so, which is really exciting. So, thank you. I want to talk a bit about the process of writing this book. So, not a lot of books about thru-hiking are out there, and this is certainly the only book that is still in print that was written by a woman, by a person of color, and I felt this enormous responsibility to make a book that was for everyone, that um, isn't just this hyper-fit, godlike athlete, which the other books about thru-hiking had been written by people like that, including some close friends of mine. But I felt like it didn't reflect the majority of the people who I actually see out on lo long-distance hikes. And it didn't reflect the majority of people who needed a book like this in the first place. So everyone knows that route planning, picking gear, food, getting in shape, those are the things on my cover, are important. But none of the other books were talking about the real obstacles. And when I talked to people, they said, were why they couldn't do their dream hike, which is, how do I afford it? How do I take time off? How do I tell my family that I'm going to be gone for six months? How do I quit my job? Who's going to watch my dog? What do I do about insurance? What do I do about my mortgage? And about half the people on the trail are retirement age. How are their bodies going to adapt differently than a young, fit trail gods um, who normally write these books? So these were the issues I really wanted to get at the heart of in this book. Also. They really wanted me to use stock photos, and I resisted them and went to way more of an effort than I ever imagined, trying to collect real, authentic photos of these dirty, smelly, but incredibly happy people on the trail. Because that is the authentic look I wanted for this book, is not these beautiful models, but people who were sitting in the dirt and loving it. And I do want to give my publisher and editor a lot of credit because they did a great job breaking up um, and l doing the layout. So it comes across as bite-sized chunks that you can digest, so to speak, over a cup of coffee or breakfast. I think also the book's subtitle is Mastering the Art of the Thru-Hike. And that was kind of a working title that uh, ended up making it onto the cover because we couldn't think of anything different, which so often <laughs> ends up being how these things work with books. But I think if I were to rename it, I would call it instead from dream to reality, because I really want people to have this book on their shelf and look at it occasionally um, when stuff is tough at work or when they decide after a couple years that consulting isn't for them. And know that even when life gets hard, if they, that, that there's something else out there that could bring them answers or could bring them happiness or could bring them community, even just for a little bit while. Um, and that's the thing about through hiking. When it comes down to it, it's just walking. It's just ordinary people, people who have, may have never thought of themselves as athletes, doing this physically extraordinary thing. So uh, that is the traditional part of my through hiking career. And I can either end right now or I can talk a little bit about urban hiking. How are we doing for time? Okay, um, so I guess we're going to take questions right now. I don't know if the cards have been collected. So the projects, I'll just, while we're collecting cards, I'll talk a little bit about the projects I've mostly been working on right now, which is something called urban through hiking, which is taking that same principle of walking hundreds of miles, but all within the confines of a city. And the first city I did was Los Angeles. And even though I was a CMC student, I went into LA like three times. And so going there uh, was really something that was quite different. And along the way, I mostly went because I thought I was living in Denver at the time, and I thought that it would be a great way to train and get in 200 miles while there was snow covering the high country and it was cold in Denver. Um, but it ended up being this really interesting trip on all of these public stairways in LA. And I learned there was so much elevation gain to be had. Um, and I worked with a professional photographer, so the photos on this really, really turned out great. And it was for an article in Backpacker Magazine about urban hiking. All right. I'll, I'll keep this, this photo of this guy in the suit and my hiking poles. All right, so the first question is, how did you beat feelings of self-doubt while on the trail? 
Um, you know, I would say that that's always a challenge. And as I do more and more difficult trails, thoughts of self-doubt continue to pop up. Um, you know, I one of the things I talk about in my book is so often negative feelings that happen on trail and even off trail happen because of low blood sugar. So I stop, I take a break, I eat, um, and o so oftentimes my mood will get better. How did you afford hiking the AT right after graduating? Um, so, you know, working at the AF helped a little bit, um, <laughs> just a little bit. Uh, also, I had saved up my research, um, research funds from the three summers because I knew I wanted to hike um, a long trail, uh, living with my parents, not very glamorous answer. Um, yeah, that, that, that was about it. <laughs> what is something you have lost on a hike? Oh, man. Uh, cameras, definitely stakes, hats, gloves, uh, water bottles. The, the list could go on. Um, a lot of the smaller things end up getting lost, lip balms at various points. Um, but luckily, I can say up to this point, unlike some of my friends, I haven't lost my tent or my sleeping bag. Can you talk a bit about accessibility and that outdoors and how we can make the outdoors less exclusive for marginalized groups? That is a really good question and something I've been working on a lot. And um, it's not an easy answer. So I'm the vice president of the American Long Distance Hiking Association, which is a user group for long distance hikers. And this is something that I've really been trying to push is um, more inclusion and diversity in the outdoors. And especially when it comes to long distance hiking, there's an extra barrier of, of the huge monetary cost of going on a long hike, which actually is pretty comparable to living, not for living a normal life in the city or here, um, but it's just a lot of money to save up and the opportunity cost of not working during that time is really the, the clincher. Um, so one of the things we're doing is creating a, um, a uh, diversity inclusion committee because we spent a lot of time brainstorming how to come up with this best answer, but there are a lot of people who have thought a lot about this professionally and have really good answers. Um, but one of the things the American Long Distance Hiking Association West also does is trainings at the beginning of the season for people who are getting into hiking, who are part of the community, and going through a training um, to talk about some of the issues that happen on trail and how language can impact and make be welcoming or language can be not so welcoming. Um, a lot of people haven't really thought about this and the outdoors is um, the first time that they've had to think a lot about diversity and inclusion. And so we're trying to do a lot of the work that hopefully um, going to college at a time like right now where people are talking about this would have done for people who are older. Um, let's see, how do you keep going when the challenges never seem to end? Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's ups and downs and remembering the highs are high and the lows are low is, is a way to do that and stopping and eating and taking a break. <laughs> how would you recommend increasing access to the outdoor? Okay, that one I kind of answered, but um, it's, it's a work in progress. Um, I would like to say that as an Asian American woman, when I first started getting in the outdoors, I remember biking down Foothill after having read a, looked at an REI catalog and saw there's nobody that looks like me in that catalog and being so angry about it. And I kind of repressed that and, and for a while. And it's really, um, it's really heartening to see that a lot more people are talking about diversity and inclusion. Um, and you know, my solution at the time was to be the change I wanted to see. And now we're at a stage where there's lots of people who are willing to start having these conversations. So that's really um, inspiring to me. What music do you listen to? I listen to a lot of podcasts <laughs> these days and books. Have a, as a woman, have you ever felt threatened or unsafe due to other humans on the trail? No, although I will say that the number of people who are hitting on me, especially when I'm solo, is, is higher than normal, <laughs> um, which can be intimidating. But um, as far as unsafe, no. And I usually take some measures like not camping too close to a road because I think normally the people who will be aggressive um, tend, to be, tend to come in by a car. 
Um, so I have a few safety measures, but I haven't luckily had any issues. How has your view on minimalism and ultralight backpacking, what is your base weight? Wow, someone knows their gear. So um, I did bring my backpack, and I know I promised uh, to do a, a gear um, demo, but if I don't read a question that's more specific about gear, I'm not going to pull stuff out. Um, <laughs> Uh-oh, is that the gear question? Um, so I carry about 8 to 10 pounds of gear. So that includes my tent, my sleeping pack, my backpack, everything except my food and water. And I would say, um, yeah, I, I would probably consider myself an ultralight backpacker, and it's something that um, I've increasingly seen people, especially people with retirement age who are going out and backpacking, um, having ultralight back, thinking, oh, I can never backpack. I can't carry 70, 70 pounds anymore. And then realizing that the gear and the technology has gotten so good that you know, 10 pounds is sounding a lot more manageable. Um, so I would say that ultralight backpacking really opens the doors to a lot more people. Um, you highlighted the three major trails. What other of the 11 National Trinic trails would you recommend? Um, so uh, last year I hiked the Pacific Northwest Trail, which is one of the only east-west trails. It's 1,200 miles from Montana and Glacier National Park to the Pacific Ocean. Um, that one was really great. It went through some awesome national parks. Um, but I'd say it's, it's because it's one of the younger trails, it was designated in 2009, which is incredible. Um, it's still got some work to do as far as getting more on public land. So that when trails aren't on public land, don't have public land right-of-ways, you're walking on a highway. Uh, by you, I mean me. <laughs> I'm walking on a highway. And that's what happens when there's um, issues with access. So that's something that um, when I say I advocate for national trails, that's having more access, um, giving organizations the right to buy up private land from willing land sellers um, was one of the big advocacy issues a few years ago. Why not off-trail? I do do some off-trail. Um, I've done the Sierra High Route. Um, a lot of the routes that I've done do some combination of off-trail and on-trail, but since this particular talks about the National Trails Act, I figured I'd talk about trails. How many miles a day were you averaging on the AT? So for the speed record, I broke that record by, it had been on the books for about 20 years, and I broke it by just about a week. And it had previously been held by a woman who's um, kind of the, one of the four mothers of long distance hiking, um, and her husband, Ray Jardine, who's a big, big deal. And they're both a big deal um, in the long distance hiking community. Um, so it was really cool to have done that solo, and obviously gear is a little bit lighter, so that helped. Um, but that average was about 28 a day. Um, I think that, oh no, there's a few more over here. Have you done any through hikes internationally? If yes, what are your favorites? So I've hiked the West Highland Way in Scotland, which I would highly recommend. Um, one of the nice things about that trail is that if you want, you can stay at hostels or very nice hotels every night. Um, there's restaurants along the way. Um, there's even a whiskey distillery along the way. And the elevation gain is not really as aggressive, although it goes through some really great mountainous areas. And you have the option, too, of, of bagging peaks along the way, which I did. Um, I've also hiked the GR20 along with Brian, um, which is in Corsica, which is that island that um, belongs to France um, very reluctantly. <laughs> And that was uh, incredibly difficult, mountainous, aggressive, uh, scrambling with chains and um, incredibly beautiful. And I very much so enjoyed it. Um, so I would say those two are probably uh, a really great example of extremes. You can either go the, the very pleasant route through Scotland um, or the very aggressive but beautiful route in Corsica. And I've also hiked in Japan and Wales and some other places, but those two are probably the highest on my list. What is the most valuable thing, whether it be a skill or something about yourself that you learned during your time at CMC? Ooh. Um, I mean, from a policy perspective, being able to think about complicated issues um, a little more um, analytically. But um, yeah, I think a lot of the things that I learned from CMC, it's a funny question. A lot of the things I learned at CMC I didn't realize were important until many years after. And I think alums might also agree with that as well, who are further out. 
Um, I think that's it for questions. Any further questions? I don't know if there is, but... Um, well uh, can we uh, break the format here, or would you prefer it still written out? Um, yeah, we can break the format, sure. <laughs> Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering, you talked about sometimes hiking with a partner versus hiking totally solo. Can you talk about how, th how those are different and what it's like being like alone for so long? Yeah, um, so that's something I talk a lot about in my book because hiking with the right partner can make a trip, especially a trip that um, is right at the edge of your um, technical abilities, go much more smoothly. It can help a lot with navigation. But hiking with a partner where you don't get along can be much, much more difficult than whatever the trail would throw at you. Um, so in the book, I talk about hints and questions um, that you should ask so whoever you're hiking with. My experience was because I hiked the CDT with someone I really didn't end up getting along with so well, it was so much easier for me to hike the physically aggressive Appalachian Trail solo and break a speed record than it was to hike with this person who I didn't get along with. Um, but similarly, a few years ago, I hiked the length of the Canadian Rockies um, with uh, someone who I've hiked quite a few trails with now, um, a woman who has the when we got together to, uh, to start the trail, we walked into a, a store and we realized we were hitting the ground. Our footsteps were exactly paced and timed at the same moment. And our personalities really get along well. So that made a trail that was kind of very much so at the edge of both of our abilities so much more manageable. Um, so I would say, yeah, it's a balance and, and getting partners right is something that might even be more important than getting gear right. All right, it appears we've exhausted the question supply. Please join me in thanking Liz Thomas. And one last thing about urban hiking is I have a video online. Sorry, I'm going to have to scroll through all of my urban hiking slides. Um, I have a video online of my urban hiking. Uh -oh. Here. My urban hike in Seattle, it's uh, tinyurl.com slash hike Seattle, or if you just Google Liz Thomas hike Seattle. And it really, I explain a lot of the principles and ideas behind urban hiking. It's a cool video. So I would highly recommend checking it out. And also, I will be signing books which are for sale. So if any of you ever dream of going on a long distance hike or just have more questions about how the mechanics work, um, I'll be happy to sign books. I'll be up here. Oh, uh, one more thing. Be sure to check out Liz Thomas's free food for thought episode, which will be coming out very soon.